This is The Politics of Everything, and I'm your host, Amber Danes. Welcome to the podcast where we want to discuss the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment to equality, and much more. Our guests are experts in their field or topic of choice, even if you've not yet heard their name. This is a bipartisan podcast, so while we love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate, by no means is this a one-sided forum for any one political view. So please listen up and enjoy the politics of everything. Get ready to laugh, cringe and be challenged in this podcast episode. I'm chatting today to Marty Wilson, a former Australian comic of the year whose multifaceted career has stretched him to become a TED speaker, best-selling author, awarded copywriter, media commentator, and popular business speaker, as well as an in-demand MC. His core message is on using humour to build resilience with his programs instantly relatable for different audiences. So here we go, Marty. I'm strapped in and ready to ride the roller coaster of the politics of humour. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Wow, what an intro. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm exhausted listening to all those things that you've done and you do. <laughs> I'm an inveterate dabbler, a jack of all trades, master of none. Fair enough. So let's dive straight in. You're not yep. always going to be a stand-up comic. I mean, you don't get born into life thinking, oh, I'm going to be a stand-up comic one day, but... I guess for you, you started your career quite differently. You were a pharmacist and then went into comedy. How did that happen? I got dared into it. I was dared into doing uh, stand-up comedy. It was when I had a bit of a dabble between pharmacy and stand-up as a a copywriter. And it was back in the 90s and was all, you know, um, Apple Max and Ponytails. And and we were having this big – once a month we'd have these big goal sessions around a table and I just happened to mention that – I wouldn't mind giving stand-up a go one day. And then this typographer, it was a big open plan office, this typographer down the other end of the room piped up in front of the whole, uh, you know, there's about 20 people in the office at the time, and said, uh, I got handed this flyer at Central Station about uh, stand-up comedy tryouts tonight at the Harold Park Hotel. <laughs> and it was one of those <laughs> scenes, you know, like, I forget what the, the the proper word for the focus technique is in movies where, like, the camera just zooms in on the pr- protagonist's face and all the background goes, and it's a, uh, uh, well... I, I guess I'm trying stand up then. <laughs> wow! So you you must have had some material though. You don't just sort of get up and hope it works out. Surely? No, no. It. Um. I, I actually ended up doing. Uh. I, I enrolled in. There was a, a course attached to it where we enrolled. There was about ten of us who we sort of workshop material in front of each other for about three or four weeks, and then we took over the open mic of the Harold Park Hotel. And that was a um, – they used to call that the virgin sacrifice. They used to call, to call that at the Harold Park Hotel. I was the, the first ever graduate group of the virgin sacrifice. And um, some other uh, great comics like Arndo was a, was a graduate of a later version of the course and a, a few other people whose names escaped me. So it was one of those um, intense – but uh, friendly ways to try out a bit of material first. And then, so we got up and then they asked me back the second week and then the third week they paid me. And then it was like, hang on one second. <laughs> hang on a this minute. Be a yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, I ended up, I mean, to be honest, like I'd always been, I'd always loved humour. Like I, I remember really clearly this time when I was uh, a little kid and I was must have been like year five, year six, and I was uh, off school uh, sick and, you know, sleeping in the lounge room, one of those sort of fold-out um, mattress beds sort of things that were big in the 70s and 80s. And I remember, like, mum had to go out, and so I was home alone, and I was just desperately ill and desperately lonely. And I remember thinking that I can't wait until six o'clock comes around because the whole family would sit down in front of the goodies, on channel, on ABC and what, and all laughed together. And I just desperately missed that feeling that we all get when we, when we all laugh at the same thing together. You know, that, that lovely, lovely feeling that everybody's pretense, everybody's um, baggage drops away when you can get a whole room full of people laughing together. And I, I just had desperately had missed that and just had this deep understanding of the power of that, even when I was a kid. So, like, I was always, like, the idiot um, getting up at assemblies and um, doing sketches, making fun of the headmaster, and then, um, you know, doing 18th birthday and 21st birthday speeches and emceeing friends' weddings and things like that. So it had been something... I'd always really enjoyed doing, you know, my, my dad, when I was uh, 
telling doing stand up. My my dad used to say he'd, he'd tell his friends, "Well, it's the the best job in the world for anyone genetically predisposed to be the class dickhead." <laughs> <laughs> So I guess um, it sounds like you left pharmacy behind pretty quickly then and and you pursued that road less travelled, I guess, of comedy. Where did that take you? Like globally, did you travel? What sort of lifestyle does a stand-up comic have? When it was just myself and my then girlfriend, now wife, it was just the best fun in the world. I I travelled, I went over to the UK in 1999 following the Wallabies around for the Rugby World Cup and it was... One of the, it was back then, you know, the Aussie dollar bought 32 pence, not sort of 57 or 60 like it does now. And so I, I did a few, this is, I'd only been doing it for about a, a year and a half in Australia and, and I had won this Australian Comic of the Year thing. And so I, uh, I, I, I did a few gigs over in the UK just to help pay for my trip, just to try and earn some pounds sterling. And it was one of those lovely stories where an agent over there saw me and said, you know, oh, I can have your diary full. When are you going to move here? So I, I dragged my then girlfriend, now wife, kicking and she's English, uh, kicking and screaming back to the UK. She'd just been sponsored out here in Australia. And I dragged her back to the UK with the idea of, you know, like, being like the Beatles went to Germany for two years and did their 10,000 hours and came back. I ended up sitting on a plane next to Jimmy Barnes one day on the way out to Dubbo, doing a comedy gig out in Dubbo, and I was having a chat to Barnesy about it, and, and he said that before well, Down Under, uh, the song Down Under took off for Men at Work, he said Men at Work were supporting us, and then the song took off and we were supporting them, and they didn't have enough material to be a headline act yet. And so I was talking to him and he said, find wherever in the, wherever in the world has the biggest and best stand up comedy scene and just go there for a couple of years. And so I actually followed Barnsley's advice and moved to the UK and it was meant to, it was meant to take me there for just for a couple of years and I ended up staying for eight. And, and the great thing is when you're in the UK, you, you're flown anywhere around the world where there's a big enough band of British expats and you get to do comedy shows all around the world. So I was all through a, Asia and uh, you know the Middle East and that sort of anywhere there was a big bunch of British expats. So it was a, a wonderful time. And then we started having kids, and I realised that because you know my wife was a nurse and so she could just take Sunday Monday off and that was our weekend. And but then once we started having kids, my wife pretty much had to fit into society, just um you know with preschools and things like that. And I couldn't. And that that was when I decided that uh, I wanted to give stand up away and start. Um, writing books and being a speaker like I am now. Interesting. So I guess what ingredients do you think make stand-up comedy work? I mean, there's probably many things, but are there any sort of tried and true things that you think make it work really well? And I guess where do most people go wrong? Sure. I, I think most people go wrong exactly the same way that I went wrong for about the first six to 12 months. I I had this idea in my head. Uh, one of the uh, comics that I loved was a guy called Bill Hicks, who he ended up starting stand up when he was about 10, sneaking into comedy clubs and getting on stage. And, but his, his style, he was very much a social commentator, a political commentator, and very much of the, there are a lot of stand up comics who get up on stage and finger point at people in the audience or, or groups within society. Like, you know, these guys are dickheads. You're a dickhead. These guys are dickheads. This group of people are idiots. Like, am I the only person that can see how big of idiots these people are? That sort of thing. And I tried to, I tried to be, um, that sort of comedian when I first started, but it wasn't until I realized that the stuff that I like the best and the people that really resonates with, that really resonated with me were the people instead of standing up there and pointing at the audience saying, you're all dickheads, it's people who put their, uh, the audience in a big cuddle and say, aren't we all dickheads? And like, um, be a, like, be, be a butt of the joke as well and stop trying to be angrily ranting at the audience because it's just not me. And so getting back to your question, I think that's what most people try to do. They look up some jokes on the internet and try and do those or they sort of try and be somebody they're not rather than when, when I, um, teach people to use humor in their presentations and things like that. I say, Ask your friends, ask your partner, ask your wife, ask your husband, what are the top three or four stories that I tell socially and tell again, you know, you know those stories we all know, like we're at a dinner party or a barbecue, if the funny stories are coming out, we know that our partner's going to tell the when I was 12 at school or, you know, that that story they tell again and again and again. Exactly. Um, And so 
get those stories that are really you and really come from your sense of humor because you'll tell those really well. So instead of trying to, you know, shoehorn other people's material into, into your uh, content or your speak or speaking or your presentations, just let it come from within you and then you'll deliver it far better and you'll deliver it with confidence and then the audience will buy into it. Interesting. So even though I say you've left pharmacy behind, your credentials in that field have come to the fore a little bit. Um, you say that you use proven scientific data to craft some of your laugh out loud stories and I guess coach others. Why is science the key to making us laugh? Well, I think because humour has proven to be such a powerful thing in in communications and, you know, and, and business and life and our dealings with people is all about communications. There's there's lots of scientific data out there about what's funnier than uh, and what's funny and what's not. You know, f- for example, it has been proven that explosive sounds like K sounds and P sounds and B sounds are funnier than words that don't have those things in them. So if you're looking like, you know, Timbuktu Tech is funnier than Sydney University. A chicken and pickle toasty is funnier than a ham roll. And, and they've done, and they've done jokes, but they've done experiments where they, uh, use that type of thing in different punchlines and they get people to, to rate them. You know, they get a thousand people to rate them because, you know, humor isn't, isn't funny until people laugh at it. But there's people out there who've done experiments and to find out exactly what we really laugh at. So, if you can ed- you can educate yourself like there's um a, a guy called professor peter mcgraw who's done a book on it um there's a book called uh just called ha exclamation mark um by uh weems is the the guy's last name there's lots of books out there that and the youtube clips of people talking about the scientific data that lets you educate yourself into how to be funnier so you know why not why not dive into that That's interesting. So I guess for you, you've obviously done this for such a long time now and you've spoken to over half a million people since that first stage performance over 20 years ago. Mm. How did you sort of transition from being a stand-up comic to the lifestyle you now lead as a business speaker, an author, an MC? And I guess what did that teach you to actually change tack in your career? When I came back from being in the UK, I was over there for eight years and I, I found my comedy diary on a spreadsheet and I, and I realized that I did, my average was four and a half gigs a week for eight years when I was over there. So that's a lot of gigs. <laughs> and, and, and so I was a bit over the stage time when I came back. So I, I tried to just run away and be an author for a while, just because uh, I'd always wanted to, to, to write books. I'd always had, uh, uh, an enthusiasm for writing from my advertising days and just even when I was a kid having, you know, short stories published in the school magazine and all that sort of thing. And so I did that for a while. But uh, so I guess I considered myself an author who spoke when someone asked him to rather than a speaker as such. And uh, but I think people started to hear that I was pretty funny and, and um, you know, and, and uh, started getting asked to do more and more keynotes at conferences and things like that. And eventually, the, the, I'm drawing a graph in the air. And if you imagine one line going down and one line coming up, and then eventually the uh, the um, the balance between speaking and authoring shifted. And uh, you know, I've got I've written twelve books in this What I Wish I Knew series out there. And I, although I really enjoyed doing them, I'm not sure I'll do any more just because. Course, I, I end up, you know, last year I did uh, just over a hundred speaking gigs, and I'm ac- I'm actually back really enjoying it more, um, which I think is, you know, um, the most important thing. Because when you're doing something that you really enjoy, that you end up um, doing it a lot better. And and so I guess in in terms of what did the process teach me, I think you have to let yourself be guided by, um, you know, I love that saying, bring your great love to the world's great need. Like um, you can't give the world everything it needs, then the world needs everything. So you really have to in some point ask yourself, what part of me do I really want to give the world? And for me, it is that uh, performing thing. I, I think it really gives me a massive high. And when I'm up there doing it, the, the one thing I really love about doing speaking as opposed to doing stand-up, for example, when you're doing stand-up, you've really got to hit the audience with a punchline every 17 seconds or they just throw chicken wings at you, you know, <laughs> it, it ends up, <laughs> it, it ends up, um, the, the, in, the contract is very pure 
when you're doing stand up. Whereas when you're doing speaking, I, I talk, when, you know, if I speak for an hour, I talk about resilience and change is one of the tub- subjects I speak about. And that, uh, I talk for about three or four minutes about the process that my wife and I went through when she had, my wife has, and she doesn't mind me talking about this, had a, what she describes as a, an ongoing dance with depression and anxiety all her life. She had three episodes of crippling postnatal depression after uh, each of our kids to the point where about um, nine months after the birth of our late uh, youngest child, Charlie, I came home and over the dinner table, Ali burst into tears and slid across the table to me the goodbye letters that she'd written to myself and all three of our boys individually. And Wow, that's heartbreaking. Yeah, and, 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 and but that's... And in my talk about my What I Wish I Knew books, because I use the, because I've done over a thousand interviews for this What I Wish I Knew series now. And so the themes that keep coming up when you ask people, if you could go back and give your younger self one bit of advice, what would it be? That those themes make up my resilience, uh, my resilience talk. And it was actually that moment when Ali um, showed me the goodbye letters that led me to uh, d- to contact the Black Dog Institute and do a What I Wish I Knew about depression. So it was, it was that that really heartbreaking moment that and I can go in and talk about that for three or four minutes when I'm doing uh, a a keynote at a corporate conference or you know one of my public events or something like that whereas in stand-up you couldn't really do that you know I mean you might be able to get away with that or sort of like an Edinburgh show or a Melbourne show or something like that as long as you had a really funny story straight after it (laughs) yeah exactly yeah and so and so I find I think in terms of what that process taught me getting back to your original question after rambling for quite a bit it, it's about that that you have like you know because when I started doing stand up I thought oh this is it this is me for life but you have to be open to that evolving in uh, even further than that you know when you think you this is it uh, for the rest of your life I think I had to be open to the idea that because I get I don't know eight and a half out of ten a buzz out of doing keynote speaking as I do out of stand up like stand up's a real thrill but I get 20 times the gratification from doing speaking than I did from stand-up. Stand-up was sort of one of those, okay, the gig's over, I never see those people again, I never hear from those people again. You know, it's probably once a year you'd get someone come up to you and say, look, I'm going through a really tough time. Um, Tonight was really great for me, thank you. Whereas in speaking, you get that almost every gig, you know, because you get to hang around with people afterwards and maybe go to the drinks after the event and it's just a really, a really, really lovely, gratifying, valuable way to make a contribution to the world. I absolutely adore it. I can feel that passion and energy which even when you talk about it. Mm. And I, I know you touched briefly on the idea of resilience in that in that last answer, but it is a term that we hear a lot these days in mm. the Western world in terms of raising resilient kids or handling failure as an adult or whatever it might be. So how is it linked to comedy? And when you teach others in your presentations and programs – what is the core message around resilience that you're trying to impart? Sure. I mean, I, I guess if anyone wants to get into this more deeply, I, I've got a Google, uh, I've got a TED talk out there called Take Funny Seriously, where I explain it in a lot more detail if, if what I say next talks to you. But the, the basic synopsis of, of it is that research has shown, and, and again, like, you know, there's been so much research into how our brains work, how the psychology of the human condition over the last 20 or 30 years has shown that if you deliberately choose to laugh at your stressors, if you deliberately choose to laugh at the things that are stressing you, upsetting you, making you angry, all those things that we class as, I'm making quotation marks in the end, negative emotions, it helps you, if you laugh at your, those things, it helps you reappraise threats and reduce stress. So that the the, I can send you through the, the the links to these studies if you, if you want to put them up in your in your show notes at the end. Definitely. Uh, and so it's like if you choose to laugh at something, it's like it flicks a switch in the back of your head that says, "Well, I must be bigger than that. I must be in control of that if I can choose to laugh at it." And that increases your personal resilience. It uh, facilitates psychological well-being. And it's been shown that a great study by Can and Colette that came out in 2014 uh, has been shown to give you greater positive affect, which is a psychological term just for cheerful and more happier. <laughs> and, and who doesn't want that, you know? So just deliberately choosing to laugh at things that are driving you nuts. And because, you know, part of humor is, you know, looking at things in more than one way. And so, you know, quite often 
a lot of humour involves you think a story is going along this way and all of a sudden there's a jump in your mind and you realise that what was actually being said is something different. And so if you can deliberately choose to look at the things that are stressing you in three, four, five, ten different ways, then that's been shown to reduce stress and help you uh, reappraise the things that are driving you nuts. That's totally interesting. And I, I love that perspective that you give that you laugh at things that, you know, maybe are driving you nuts. Cause I think our instant reaction, well, mine personally, I can't speak for everybody, obviously, is, oh my goodness, I'm just going to rant. I'm going to be angry. I'm going to be resentful. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't make you feel any better. It doesn't actually solve the problem. So no. it's an interesting way to kind of turn it on its head, if you like. Yeah. There, there used to be uh, a psychological school of thought that. It, um, it was cathartic for you to rant about, uh, things like that, but they've shown, uh, more recent studies have shown that that isn't actually the case and it's actually not good for you to go, uh, to go ranting and screaming about things that are, uh, upsetting you. So back to your comedy piece. Mm-hmm. Do you have a fail proof comedy story which we will probably all laugh at and one that you think that even make the sternest looking British Tory guy laugh? <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, let me cue up a sound effect because the punchline to it is a sound effect. Hang on a sec. Um, all right. There we go. Uh, for th- those of you, for the listeners, um, if you, if you have kids, for those of you who are listening who have kids, like when I say this in an audience, I say, who's got kids? Put your hand up and I say, leave your hand up. If when you had your first child, you had a birthing plan. Did you, did you have kids, Emma? Oh, yes, I've got two. I, and I, I think I had a birthing plan for the first one. The yeah, second yeah. one I knew better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I say. I say, um, you know, leave your hand up if your birth went exactly like your birthing plan. And they, they never do. They never do. And so, uh, I, um, I, I, my wife's an accident emergency nurse. And so her birthing plan was no doctors, don't any doctors, no medical intervention. And so, we were booked into the the midwife led unit, which is uh, next to the hospital, but not part of the hospital. You know, it, it DIY birth, if you like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. You know, we were booked into you know the you know the big spa pool where you give birth in there, and the um, there were dream catchers up on the wall. She'd been doing the meditation for birthing. There were you know like electric candles so the gas wouldn't explode or something like that. And, and we get to the hospital, and sadly, you know, after fifteen minutes, we were like undiagnosed breech baby. So the baby's the right way up instead of up. Upside down, and so you know we think we're going over here to the midwife-led unit with the soft dream catchery in the spa pool. Forty-five minutes, like we get to the hospital, you know, because we've turned up with like enough food to last three days and enough Enya to last a week, you know, because because my wife just loves Enya, and I just fucking hate Enya, you know. But it's totally her show, so absolutely bring those thirty-seven Enya CDs, my darling. So. We think we're going to the, the birthing pool. Uh, we're 45 minutes later. We're in. My wife is numb from the chest down. We're in the operating theatre, and the surgeon's about to open her up and do an emergency Caesar. Now, I think the anaesthetist could tell that my wife was quite upset by this, so he leans down and whispers into her ear and says, "Oh, Mrs. Wilson, would, would you like me to turn the radio on? Would you like some music during the procedure, like during the operation?" And my wife just looks up at me with this earnest, angelic look in her eyes and just said, wouldn't it be a sign if Enya came on the radio? And like, I'm, I'm not an idiot, so I'm just like, yes, darling, it would. <laughs> and this song, at this point in the song, is what came out of the stereo. I'll, I'll play it and hope it comes down the line to you. Oh, no. <laughs> and and my wife was just shaking with laughter. And it was just the perfect metaphor for what life is really like, you know, because in that moment, you know, we could have exploded into anger. We could have dissolved into tears, but our eyes locked and we just chose to laugh. And all the tension in that room about the birth not going the way it should have, you know, the, you know, uh, the, the clinical atmosphere in the operating room, all that tension was dispersed. And we got on with the idea of, look, we're not getting our beautiful firstborn child the way we thought we were going to, but we're still getting our beautiful firstborn child. What a great story. I guess um, I'm a big believer that many people have mentors or inspirational people that have guided them along the way, not always in the same industry, but they can be. Do you have any, and what have they taught you about success and, I guess, the, the business path you've travelled? I guess uh, the way I would answer that question is doing the interviews for this What I Wish I Knew series. You know, I've, I've interviewed 
over a thousand amazing, amazing people, and some of whom whose stories we know, you know, like Arn Doe, the Vietnamese comic, Naomi Simpson from Shark Tank, Wayne Bennett, the footy coach, like uh, Julia Morris out in the jungle with the celeb, Maggie Beer, AFL legend, Mark Rusciuto, John Eels, like all these people whose stories we know, but mostly it's just been people like you and I who've been through extraordinary things. Like I've interviewed depression survivors, I've interviewed cancer survivors, I've interviewed World War II survivors, I've interviewed 9-11 survivors, I've interviewed like a, a Buddhist nun who works with prisoners on death row in Los Angeles, you know, I've interviewed celebrity comedians the world over. And when, and so I wouldn't say I've had key mentors, it's more the but the sheer weight of mentorship that I've got from interviewing that many people and asking them, you know, how to do life well, how to get to the end of your days, and the way I describe it in my keynote is like how to get to the end of your days and be sitting on a park bench arm in arm with someone you adore, looking back on your life with a big satisfied smile instead of a heart full of regrets. And the sheer weight of advice that I've got from those people has just been absolutely extraordinary for me and been um, a constant. You know, some people say like a particular bit of advice gave them a big springboard into the future or something like that. I, I would say I've been very lucky through writing these books that I've that I've just been given constant course adjustments in my business, in my personal life, in my fatherhood, uh, in my uh, relationship with my wife. You know, I've very luckily had lots and lots of people uh, giving me lots of wonderful advice and say, if there's if there's one way I could wrap that up about people is uh, wrap that up for your listeners. It's um, and it's it might sound simplistic, it might sound trite, but just talk to people. You know, I, I do a lot of these corporate conferences and that sort of thing, and you hear people talking in the bars afterwards after they've had a full day's conference, and you hear, you know, oh mate, how business going? Oh, kicking girls with both feet, big fella. Don't you worry about that sunshine. You know, like all these <laughs> um, bullshit, fake, surface level conversations. Whereas I, I say to them, you know, if, um, when I'm up on stage, like, don't do that. You know. You've got a thousand people in this room. Ask yourself, and I give them five seconds of background music. What's the number one problem in your business or in your personal life or in your relationship with your nearest and dearest that drives you nuts? And I give them five seconds to think about it. I say, you've got a thousand people in this room. If you ask 20 people before you go home in two days' time, how do they handle that better, whether it's work-life balance or email overload or whatever it is? Ask 20 people in this room, you will go home with five awesome solutions. But we don't. We just, we walk through life trying to kid ourselves and each other that, oh, no, I got my stuff together. I don't need your advice. Thank you very much, pal. And it's just such a waste. Interesting. Well, thank you for sharing that. If we could just wrap up, what are some maybe top one, two or three tips you have for everyone on the politics of humor? How do we make it better in our everyday lives for us to be funnier and perhaps more resilient? Sure. I guess it's, uh, the, the, the reason I titled my TED talk this, just take funny seriously. Don't, most of us walk through life and stumble along, stumble across the funny and really enjoy it when it happens rather than deliberately choosing to try and create more humor in our lives. You know, uh, humor breaks down barriers in our personal life. So every night, uh, with our kids, we ask our kids, what made you laugh at school today? And then it, it deli- like we make deliberate attempts to create funny in our kids' lives and in our lives when we have dinner together. So do that. And of course, that, that feeling that I talked about when I, when I was younger and I was sick at home, that feeling when everybody in the room is laughing at the same thing together. It just is, there's a magical effect that goes on in your brain when that happens. And, all the, um, you know, all the social barriers come down. In business, I would say exactly the same thing. So, like, where our brains evolved to be in tribes of about 200 or less people. And so, there's a lot of, uh, there's a few us in our brains and there's a lot of them. Most of the world, our brains separate into them. And if you're trying to uh, connect with people, trying to influence people, they see you as a them, not an us. But if you can get them laughing, either at uh, particularly at yourself or a shared frustration or common enemy. If you can get people laughing uh, at one of those three things, all of a sudden those barriers come down and they see you as an us. Our brain gets flooded with these wonderful chemicals when you can make somebody laugh and you're both laughing at the same thing instantly. It's like instead of facing you and considering you a them, it's like your arm and arm, shoulder, arm around each other's shoulder, considering each other an us, looking at the same thing. 
So deliberately try to use humor in your business. So use humor in your personal life and use humor in your business. And, and don't wait for it to happen. Deliberately try to create humor. Again, I'll, I'll give you all the studies about, you know, if, you, if you're in a leadership position at work and you can crack a joke, it enhances your perceived leadership skills. It builds credibility. Um, it increases persuasion. It increases long-term memory retention. If you can wrap your message in humor, it, uh, it increases long-term memory retention. It's such a powerful tool. Oh, I've loved hearing that. Thank you so much for your time today. If you do want to connect further with Marty, there'll be some details on the show notes. You've been listening to The Politics of Everything. Until next time, keep well. Thanks for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, we thrive on feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network, your friends and family. I'm also always on the hunt for fabulous new guests. So if you've got a view to share and an idea how to get our listeners excited, please email me at amber at bespoke comms, that's B-E-S-P-O-K-E-C-O-M-M-S dot com dot A-U and we'll be sure to get back to you. Until next time.